If everyone could please take your seats. If everyone at the back of the reception could please move up to the front and take your seats up here. We'd like to get started momentarily. Thank you. Thank you to those who are listening to me and coming up and sitting. Can I have your attention, please, everyone? If everyone could please come up and take your seats, we'd like to get started. But it, is, it is, but we cannot start. Shh. If everyone could please, can I have everyone's attention, please? If you could all take your seats, we cannot start until everyone takes their seats. There's plenty of seats up here. You could take your beverages and food up here, if you like, right here. Thank you. If everyone could move up, there are plenty of seats up here in the front rows. If you can move down the aisles and take your seats, that would be wonderful. Thank you. You can move up the center aisle. There are plenty of seats up here. If you could just fill in the front two rows, that would be wonderful. Thank you to everyone who's here in person. And thank you for members and guests joining virtually as well and for listening to me, trying to get everyone seated here in person. Welcome to today's Council on Foreign Relations meeting. A reminder that this meeting is on the record. And for those in person, if you could please take a moment and silence your electronic devices so we don't have any interruptions, that would be appreciated. During the Q&A session, if you're here in person and would like to ask a question, raise your hand. If you're called on, we ask that you stand, take a microphone, introduce yourself, and ask your question. If you're joining virtually, you can click on the raise hand icon at any point. During the Q&A, if you hear your name being called out, please accept the unmute now prompt. And a reminder that your video will remain off, but you will be unmuted so everyone in person and on Zoom can hear you introduce yourself and ask your question. Again, a reminder that this meeting is on the record. Thank you, everyone. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining us, both those here in the room and those on uh, Zoom. I'm Mike Froman, President of the Council, and it was really a great uh, pleasure and honor to be here with Ben Steele, Senior Fellow, Director at the Council, and author of the new book, The World That Wasn't, Henry Wallace and the Fate of the American Century, which I recommend to you. Uh, it's a heavy read, uh, but it's, uh, but it, but it's, a, but it's a, a good one. Um, we have about 150 people or so on Zoom, in addition to the folks here. As we said, we'll talk for about a half hour and then open it up to questions, and it's all uh, on the record. Um, the book lays out how close we were to having a president who was uh, truly outside the mainstream of political thought, uh, really one of the most bizarre and colorful characters, I think, in American uh, politics. He was a member of a religious cult, uh, who surreptitiously did their bidding, referred to its leaders as father and mother, wrote them, quote, guru letters. Uh, he was uh, a communist sympathizer who worked at times secretly with Soviet intelligence and sometimes with Stalin directly or indirectly uh, to support its policies vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Uh, he was a candidate for president uh, who didn't do very well, became increasingly at odds with the mainstream of political thought, particularly around the Cold War, the Marshall Plan, the Truman Plan. He crashed and burned spectacularly as a, as a political candidate. But he came within a hair's breadth of being president when the choice was made to choose Harry Truman over him as FDR's uh, fourth term vice presidential uh, running mate. In the meantime, though, he was Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary of Commerce, Vice President. Ben, how did someone so odd uh, rise and stay at the top of the government apparatus for so long? He was never elected to any position in his own right. Um, his political career was made entirely by one man, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. 
um, Roosevelt um, made him uh, agriculture secretary in his first term. And it, uh, on, on paper, at least, Wallace was a very logical choice. I mean, he came from agricultural aristocracy in Iowa. Um, his grandfather, uh, all, all the firstborn sons in the family, going back for many generations, are Henry's, um, uh, founded a very influential farm journal called Wallace's Farmer. And this is at a time when over 40% of the US population lives on farms. So it's, it's, it's a very influential publication. Um, uh, Wallace's father, Henry, um, takes over the Farm Journal and then becomes Agriculture um, Secretary under Harding and Coolidge. Um, the Wallace of our story takes over the um, journal. He's quite an influential um, writer on agriculture. But <clears throat> most importantly, he is in his own right an extremely accomplished, self-taught um, agricultural geneticist. He starts doing experiments on hybridization of corn um, while he's in his teens. Um, his first successful experiments are when he's 16. And virtually all the corn that we eat today derives from his um, uh, experiments to improve corn. Chickens as well in his retirement. That'll, we'll leave that for, for, for later. Um, but he was a, so he was a logical choice for um, agriculture secretary, again, at least on paper. Um, views are radically split as to whether he was a great agricultural secretary or a terrible one. I'll leave that for later discussion. But the, the most important um, uh, event in his political career is, is FDR deciding that he should be vice president in 1940, um, uh, above vociferous objections from within the party, not just on the right, but on the left. Um, uh, a lot of prominent liberals like Harold Ickes considered him to be a, you know, a Johnny come lately. He had been a Republican, now a Democrat. He'll later become a progressive. He'll later then become an independent. He'll endorse Eisenhower. I mean, he has a very volatile um, political career. And then the seminal moment, moment in his career comes in um, 1944. There's a wild, open Democratic um, convention for vice president because FDR refuses to put his fingerprints on the weapon for his, what, what is, in effect, a political murder. It's already been decide, decided he's going to be maneuvered off the ticket. But he doesn't cooperate. And he almost wins. Um, and if he had won, of course, he would have become president when FDR died in April of 45. Mm -hmm. And after that, we have a fascinating counterfactual history. Um, we do know certain things that there would have been no Marshall Plan, no NATO, no, Europe, no European um, Union, um, no policy of containment, uh, no West Germany. Um, it would have been a very different world that we live in today. Indeed. I mean, take, take one of the issues that actually has relevance uh, today, which was the, the issue around how to deal with nuclear technology. And he was in that camp that was advocating for handing over U.S. nuclear know-how to the Soviet Union um, as a way of balancing and ensuring them and discouraging them from pursuing it uh, on their own. Now, he wasn't the only one. There were others, uh, including Oppenheimer, we know, now know from the book and, and the movie, um, and, uh, uh, and others who, who made similar arguments. But his was really quite unilateral in his, uh, in his approach. Seems rather fanciful, given what we now know about the Soviet Union, including what we know about the UN and its effectiveness, because mm -hmm. his idea was that the UN should control all nuclear power uh, going forward. Lessons to be learned from that. We now have a, a, a discussion about what to do about new technology, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, quantum computing, synthetic biology, all of which have implications for national security, um, some of which people say, well, we should, we should slow it down. We should hand it over to some international organization to approve. What lessons do you take from that period of time and Wallace's position, the, the pros and the cons, about how we should deal with current technological issues? Well, official US atomic policy at that time, so now we're, we're talking about um, 1946, is the so-called Baruch Plan. Um, so Bernard Baruch, uh, financier, comes from the right of the Democratic um, Party, is um, appointed um, head of the US 
delegation to the new UN Atomic Energy Commission. And um, the Baruch plan is mainly based on work that had already been done by others, in particular Dean Acheson and David Lilienthal. And it was a really genuinely serious effort to gum, come to grips with the sort of problems you're describing. And they laid out a, a phased plan by which the United States would uh, progressively turn over um, scientific knowledge uh, in the atomic uh, energy space and disarm, um, in return for which the Soviets in particular, but of course others would have to agree to this as well, would submit to um, international inspection. By the UN. By the, by the, by the new UN. Now, um, Oppenheimer and other scientists were very skeptical about Bar Baruch, but in the end, there wasn't great difference between Baruch's plan and what these scientists were endorsing. But Wallace's views were really quite radical. It's not just that he endorsed the um, Soviet um, proposal, um, which was that they would never submit to international inspections because they were a violation of Soviet um, sovereignty, um, but that the, the U.S. should begin disarming unilaterally. And the Soviet position was that the, that was to mischaracterize the American position. That is, the Americans would keep it entirely at their discretion as to when they would begin to hand over knowledge and um, put their weapons into um, escrow. Um, this was completely wrong. It was not the U.S. position, even though Wallace was saying it was in public. And I dug to find out where he got it from. And I found it in an article in Pravda in June of 1946. Excellent now, source of information <laughs> on US policy. Uh, After reading this article, I was gobsmacked. But then I also came across the private notes of a New York Times journalist who interviewed him around that time. And, and Wallace himself referred to that Pravda article. He probably hadn't read it himself. He never dealt with details on his own. He left those to his subordinates, who were on Most the Most of whom were Soviet agents. They were CPUSA right. members, in some, in some cases open CPUSA members, in some cases concealed one. But his main advisor was a man named Harry Magdoff, who was a Soviet agent, who had handed over Wallace's private cabinet um, papers on atomic energy to the Soviets. He wrote Wallace's position uh, papers on uh, atomic um, energy, and they were based on this article in Pravda. And it really did undercut the US negotiating position to have a cabinet secretary coming out and contradicting um, the head of the UN delegation in terms of what the US policy was. Um, so the Baruch plan was a serious attempt, in my view, um, to internationalize the problem of um, controlling um, atomic energy for military use. It failed. It was inevitable that it was going to fail, as we know now, because Stalin was absolutely determined um, to, to get his bomb. And he was, I know from the Soviet archival material I've read, simply using the UN negotiations as a stall tactic. But you, you bring up a very good question with regard to today. The world has shrunk so much. And so these types of issues are becoming more and more important. And some form of international control is essential. We saw that in global health recently with the pandemic. There was a, an article in the Wall Street <coughs> Journal recently about how Chinese scientists had mapped the COVID-19 virus two weeks before the Chinese government um, revealed this information to the World Health Organization. We really have to do better than that at an international level if we're going to control the most devastating potential aspects of globalization. You just said something in passing that I want to, to flesh out uh, for, for our members here. Uh, there are previous biographies of, of Wallace, but this one is unique because of the sources that you had access to. Tell us about those sources and what different perspective they gave on Henry Wallace. Okay, my last book, as you know, it had been an historical narrative on the Marshall Plan. 
Um, and that was based overwhelmingly on new Soviet um, archival material that I had uh, unearthed in Moscow. And it, uh, in that material, I wasn't looking for it, but I found some tidbits about Wallace's role in the Marshall Plan. So I had an inkling that there might be something there. Um, I had no idea. Um, it was an absolute gold mine. The two main Russian um, state political archives, um, known as AP, ABPRF and RGASP, they're quite well known among Soviet scholars in the United States, had material that had apparently never been seen before, fascinating material um, relevant to Wallace. And uh, also there, there, there was archival material that I had not known anything uh, about. For example, the, there's a Rarick, Nicholas Rarick Museum. Nicholas Rarick was Wallace's uh, white Russian guru in the 1930s. There is a Rarick Museum in um, uh, Russia, and they have um, uh, archives on the connection between the two of them, which was, that material was literally just jaw-dropping. You had some FBI wiretaps as well, right? yeah. the counterintelligence um, wiretaps. So um, uh, just one more closing comment about the, the, the Russian archives. Uh, these are totally inaccessible today, so I could not write the book today. In February of 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine, the work that the, Soviet, the Russian archival specialist was doing for me, sending me back these documents, became retroactively criminalized. Um, she's in her 70s now and had to flee the country. I mean, it's a really very, very sad, serious, serious uh, story. Um, with regard to the FBI archives, two books ago I had written a historical narrative on, on Bretton Woods and I had made my first Freedom of Information Act request to the FBI for um, any material they had on Harry Dexter White, um, who was um, a major Soviet asset, and they gave me 13,000 pages. Uh, all, all heavily redacted or not redacted? Uh, redacted. Okay. Uh, absolutely redacted, but there was still plenty of very valuable material in there. I found 18 Soviet intelligence cables that had um, been uh, intercepted and decoded by US military intelligence that mentioned White under his various code names and his activities on their behalf. So I already was familiar with those archives and I thought they could be useful here and they were incredibly useful. And the reason is that so many of the people under Wallace at Commerce, so this is from April of 45 to September of 46 when Truman fires him, were um, uh, Soviet agents or assets and were being carefully monitored um, by the FBI. So when I would see Wallace taking positions that I didn't understand, you know, why is he saying this? Where does he get his numbers? I would just go to the FBI archives and look around those dates for the people under him like Magdoff, their phones were being um, uh, tapped, they were being followed, and the material was very enlightening. It would explain exactly why Wallace was saying what he was saying when he was saying it. One of the things that uh, actually left me with a question after reading the book is uh, Wallace starts off uh, in his career being quite anti-communist, right? And call, particularly from sort of a religious perspective, called them godless and yeah. was, was very much in that camp. Then he becomes a total communist and Soviet sympathizer, including going on this kind of remarkable uh, journey through Siberia of seeing a number of literally Potemkin villages and reporting back that the Soviet Union's got all the answers uh, now to all of the world's problems, then reverting again later on to being a cold warrior yeah. and sort of buying into the cold. What does this say about him that he goes from anti-communist, pro-communist, is it, is it like a state of mind or his mental process? What, what do you think accounts for the fact that he- His views are very volatile. Hmm. Um, throughout his career. But he also would, even when his views were consistent, he would often make completely contradictory arguments to support them. And it never bothered him when these were pointed out. I, I, I <laughs> say it in the book. For him, 
um, you know, arguments supporting a position were like the clothes we change every day. We may change our clothes, but it doesn't make us any less righteous. And Wallace, to himself, was the ultimate righteous man. And he could change his arguments. It didn't affect the fact that his positions were righteous. And he believed, given to him by a, a, a higher authority. With regard to the Soviets, it's really quite interesting. Yes, in the 1920s, um, he was very critical of the uh, Soviets, um, in particular because he thought the Bolsheviks were godless. And he was a religious, very spiritual man in an unconventional way, but nonetheless very much God-fearing. Um, but he was utterly fascinated with um, Stalin's experiments with um, agricultural collectivization. Um, he knew that there were some human rights issues surrounding As I it. recall, that collectivization didn't work out so well, right? No. no. Uh, but he, he, he argued that, you know, it was worth it because the Soviets are making major advances in uh, agriculture and it's going to improve the living standards of the country. Um, and he believed these were the sort of reforms we needed in the United States, but couldn't pursue them because of our messy democratic processes. Now, he didn't want to get rid of democracy, but he was nonetheless fascinated with a country that he was convinced was run fundamentally by technocrats who were pursuing agricultural reforms and other reforms in the public interest. Now, with regard to 1933, when he opposes vociferously um, FDR's recognition of the Soviet Union, that baffled me, too, when I started writing the book. <coughs> and I discovered exactly where that came from. As you know, having read the book during that period, um, he was in the thrall of his Russian um, guru, um, who in 34 he sends off on an uh, expedition in Central Asia in theory to search for drought resistant um, seeds, in reality to recreate the mythical um, or legendary Shambhala in right. Central Asia. He's, uh, Nicholas Rerick is going to create a new theocratic state in Central Asia. And at, Rerick himself is a very volatile character and at some points in his career um, he's anti-Bolshevik, and other t part, t times in his career, he's pro-Bolshevik when he thinks that he can manipulate the Soviets into supporting his endeavors. In this particular period, he's absolutely anti-Bolshevik, and he issues um, uh, orders um, from India to Wallace um, in Washington that he is to oppose so, so uh, American recognition of the Soviet Union with every fiber of his body, and he does. He argues with FDR um, that this is not in the American interest. First, it's, it's, um, it will lead to um, spiritual decay in the United States. Um, and second, that it's, it's terrible as a, a matter of economics to have anything to do with them. Once he breaks with the Rerics in 35, this changes dramatically, and he becomes very um, close to the Soviets. When he loses his presidential uh, election race in 1948, he doesn't just lose, he becomes not the third party candidate, but the fourth party candidate, right. uh, getting fewer votes than the Dixiecrat segregationist Strom Thurmond. He turns violently against the American communists and the um, Soviets, who he believes have, like Nicholas Rerick, let him down. And so he begins uh, evolving his views on the Soviet Union once again. So let's talk about that election. 1948 uh, is active effort by the Soviet Union to, sh to work with uh, Wallace to shape the outcome of the election. Wallace writes an open letter to Stalin, and Stalin replies. Sort of suggesting that if Kabuki play, yeah, all that's right. That if, that if Wallace is elected, perhaps a Cold War can can be avoided. Is this the first instance of foreign interference in an election? <laughs> <laughs> Any lessons we should learn? Uh, it's it's not the first, even for the the Soviets. Um, so I did some digging in this area and found that it it, it started in 1924. Um, be, uh, when they became fascinated by the, the independent progressive party campaign of Fighting Bob La Follette. Hmm. 
on a, a platform of nationalizing key American industries and ending American imperialism abroad. The Soviets become quite fascinated with this movement and they begin um, covertly financing the CPUSA in the United States um, and issue them instructions to start infiltrating um, pro progressive organizations throughout the United States. And the progressive party that Wallace comes to lead um, uh, in 1948 is basically the whole um, uh, apparatus of the organization is controlled by the CPUSA um, under instructions in some cases directly from um, uh, Moscow. This doesn't mean that there weren't progressives within this new party who were genuinely democratic progressives, but they were not influencing the uh, movement. What's unique about 1948 is that this collusion, as it were, was initiated entirely by Henry Wallace, not by the Soviets. So what I discovered in the Soviet archives is that um, in March of 1948, Wallace, who knows the UN, Soviet UN ambassador, Andrei Gromyko, doesn't contact him directly, but uses a secret intermediary the um, Czech UN ambassador, um, his name is Hudek, and starts um, sending documents to Gromyko through Hudek. Hudek arranges private meetings with Gromyko, at which Wallace says that um, he wants to um, uh, come to this, this grand agreement with Stalin to end the Cold War. Gromyko says, well, what do you want in this agreement? And this is where the jaw-dropping stuff comes in, Wallace says, I don't care. Comrade Stalin can lay this out. And so Stalin does an enormous amount of the, the writing of the um, conditions that will be in the agreement. He edits some of Wallace's um, conditions. I have documentary proof that I put in the, the book. He's a little smarter than Wallace politically. <laughs> and uh, sends, sends back a um, memo to Gromyko saying the meeting that Wallace wants is not a good idea. Okay, we you wanted to then go see Wallace Stalin. wanted to go to Moscow to meet Stalin. In during, during a political campaign. During a right. presidential campaign. It's just wild. It's got a good and look. Stalin says, yeah. not, not a good idea. But <laughs> he says, he says a, 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 a letter, a statement, he said, would, would, be, would be fine. And um, with Stalin's approval, he talks about himself in the third person. So Wallace writes this open letter um, with Stalin's assistance. He reads it before a crowd of 19,000 at Madison Square Garden on May 11, 1948. And one week later, like clockwork, Stalin issues his uh, official statement endorsing it. Now, it doesn't help. Wallace's campaign in the least. At this point, the American public has turned staunchly uh, against the Soviets. They feel, on the whole, I refer to a lot of opinion polls at the time, that Truman is not being nearly tough enough. Um, so this doesn't, in fact, help Wallace. But um, there's never been a clearer case in US history of a violation of the 1799 Logan Act. Logan Act, right. <laughs> so, uh, Political scientists often debate the relative importance of uh, the individual, the leader, versus the bureaucracy or the nation state as determining outcomes in, um, in international relations. Had Wallace been elected, do you think he would have been able to, as you say, turn the ship on all of these issues? Or do you think the deep state, the bureaucracy, would have prevented him from driving the US off the ledge? Well, there's no doubt that there would have been enormous bipartisan resistance to many of his initiatives in Congress. Um, so for example, um, uh, Wallace, who had initially endorsed the Marshall Plan, turned violently against it when Stalin did. So there would have been no Marshall Plan. But instead of the Marshall Plan, Wallace wanted a $50 billion, this is in current dollars, $650 billion U.S. reconstruction aid package to be entirely controlled by the United Nations. No U.S. control. We just give $650 billion to the U.N. 
and they're going to um, distribute that money, and it's going to go mainly to the victims of um, Nazi aggression, who of course are primarily the Soviets. Okay. So we, we would have given under Wallace's plan in current <coughs> dollars hundreds of billions of dollars to the Soviet Union. Needless to say, this was going nowhere um, uh, in Congress. So obviously there, there, there were going to be effective checks and balances. Nonetheless, look, as we learned from the Trump years, the executive in this country is very powerful. And particularly in foreign policy, often the executive can pretty much do as it pleases until the uh, legislature or the judiciary stands up and says, no, 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 we're going to try to stop you. Um, and so I think the, the, the problems with a Wallace presidency would have been primarily those of inaction. Um, we, we know that Stalin uh, coveted Hokkaido, um, the entire Korean um, peninsula, northern Iran, where he had troops after the, the war, um, Turkey and the Turkish Straits, the Dardanelles, Greece, and Germany. We can pretty much assume that all of those would have been lost by the end of um, Wallace's first term. So there's no doubt, and Wallace himself says this in his retirement, I would not have been elected in 1948. But by 1948, the world would have really changed beyond recognition. So the Cold War would still have happened, but we would have started fighting it with a new president mm -hmm. um, at a very distinct disadvantage. Yeah, last question before I open it up so everyone get ready with your, your questions. Um, you're a political economist. This is not a book about political economy. What drove you to spend four years of your life writing this book? Well, actually, I'm a financial economist. Financial, excuse me. Yeah, financial I, I actually wrote my PhD thesis on optimal hedging strategies. So you can see I'm, a nice waiting, linear I'm path. For, I'm waiting for the movie here. Uh, <laughs> um, so it was John Lewis Gaddis at um, Yale, the Cold War historian, who convinced me while I was writing the Marshall Plan book that this should be next on my agenda. Initially, I thought that was that was kind of nuts and probably not up my alley, but um, by the time I finished that book, I was really excited about doing something, again, with a biographical element, as I had with the uh, Bretton Woods um, uh, book. Um, uh, let me just push back a little on the notion that this is not a book about political um, uh, economy. Fundamentally, I, I was interested, fascinated with this period in the 1940s when the United States is at the apex of its political, economic, and military um, power in the world, and all the different visions that it could have pursued for a world order. And so I really consider this book to be the third in a trilogy on the political economy of this um, uh, period. Um, if I think about my favorite political biographers, Robert Caro, who wrote, of course, Lyndon Johnson um, biography, and uh, Robert Moses, um, Steve Kotkin, who's written Stalin's uh, biography, these two men were driven fundamentally by an interest in the concept of power where it came from, how it was developed, how it was used. And I think that's why their books are so compelling, because there's an underlying passion that's separate from the individuals. Uh, now, I'll leave it, leave it to readers to, to judge, but I wanted to tell a story about the political economy of the 1940s through this absolutely fascinating human being. Um, and I think if you, you put together a compelling story about, you know, why are we where we are today? If you put it together with a, a fascinating historical figure like Henry Wallace, you've really got a, an interesting, interesting book. And a compelling one. All right, let's open it up for, uh, uh, for questions here, right here in the front row. Mike's coming to you. Just identify yourself. Ben, uh, Ricardo Tavares from Google at 
Thanks so much for your writing because it's uh, you write well and you write about things that are very important, which makes really interesting and easy to read because you attract us like to a novel. And my question is, in your book about Bretton Woods, you described how the top treasury negotiator on behalf of the United States in that conference was a Soviet agent. Now you come up with a book that shows how strong Soviet influence was over a vice president of the United States. What do you think make, made um, Soviet spying so effective in that period? Is it because the US and the Soviet Union were allies against Nazi Germany? Or the focus, the fact that they had or I already organized their spy agents where we're organizing ours. So what um, I would love to, to get your thoughts on this. A, a few things I would say. First, first of all, a fascinating thing I discovered in writing the book that Wallace, if he had become president, either on FDR's death or if he had been elected in his own right, um, would almost certainly have made Lawrence Duggan from the State Department, Secretary of State, and Harry Dexter White, Secretary of the Treasury. Um, both of these men, if not agents, were major Soviet assets, in particular, Harry Dexter White. So this is really, they would have penetrated at the highest levels of the US government. Why were they successful? Well, you, uh, figures like Harry Dexter White were quite typical in the US government at that time. They were either first or second generation, in many cases, um, immigrants from the old Russian Empire. And they were not mainly pro-Bolshevik or pro-communist, so much as anti-Tsarist, because of the conditions under which their families had left um, Europe. So they wanted to believe, desperately to believe, that the Soviet Union was, with all the mistakes they were making in certain areas, were moving towards a model of what Wallace called economic democracy that was superior to ours. So they were, they were romantics in this regard. And the Soviets worked through people like that. Now, Harry Dexter White um, would never have a, uh, acknowledged that he did anything wrong because he really didn't believe he did anything wrong. Did he know that he'd done things that were illegal? Almost certainly, yes. But he, was, he felt that he was defending true American national interest against the Republican isolationists, the reactionary Catholic hierarchy, people who were keeping the country back. They really did believe this. The Soviets themselves were not great um, um, spies in the um, United States. They de depended <coughs> on people like this. Their network really began um, uh, collapsing um, in late 1945 when Elizabeth Bentley, who was an American spy for the Soviets, walked into an FBI office and said, I've been spying. Um, initially, she gave them a cockamamie story about Soviet spying going, going on that the FBI thought, you know, we got, we got bigger fish to fry. But then when she said, I'm a spy, they started paying attention. And then she started naming names, dozens and dozens and dozens of names. And that's when I discovered, when I wrote the Bretton Woods book, that the only reason that Harry Dexter White did not become the first US IMF um, um, uh, managing director was because Hoover threatened to expose the fact that White was an agent. So we gave it to the Europeans. And the Europeans still run the IMF to this day <laughs> because of a spy scandal. But after that, the um, Soviet spy network in the United States literally collapsed almost overnight. So the, by the time we get to 48 and the presidential campaign, they're really flying blind. And the, you, you see people in Moscow like Molotov who really start entertaining romantic visions that maybe this, maybe this um, Wallace guy could actually win. And that's because they're not getting back good information from the United States anymore. 
Interesting. This gentleman in the fourth row. Uh, Stephen Blank. Ben, one more task from you is enough already. <laughs> You're killing me. <laughs> um, you had mentioned, talked about the power of the executive. But Wallace wasn't really a chief executive in the sense of being elected. Uh, mm -hmm. When Truman became president after Roosevelt died, he knew very little about what's going on. But he had his own bunch and friends that played cards with in the Senate. He knew how that worked. Did anyone, did Wallace have any support, political support, in the, in the Senate, uh, in the administration, or uh, if he had become president? Uh, the, the short answer is no. Um, when he was vice president from um, uh, um, 41 to 44, he alienated everyone in the Senate, both parties. He couldn't stand the Senate. So his predecessor, um, John Nance Garner, mm -hmm. uh, was a real creature of the, the Senate. He spent his day having boozy meals with um, senators um, in his office. And to make sure that the convivialities wouldn't get interrupted, he installed a urinal in the corner of his office. As you can imagine, there was only one sex involved in these um, uh, particular um, uh, uh, wet meals. Um, okay. Now, as soon as Wallace comes um, into office, he destocks the bar. There's going to be no drinking in his office, and he gets rid of the urinals. And um, senators like um, the junior senator from um, Missouri, Harry Truman, uh, don't like coming to visit the vice president anymore. Nobody wants to deal with this guy. Um, Wallace hated the Senate. He hated presiding there. Uh, he spent as little time there as uh, possible. He used to send um, surrogates um, to, uh, to preside. So by the time we get to 44 and the wild open convention, Wallace has really burned all his political um, capital uh, in Washington. He really has very few um, supporters left. Let's go to an online question, then we'll come back to the room. We'll take our next question from Avis Bolin. Miss hmm. Bolin, please accept the unmute now prompt. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. This is fascinating. Um, I wonder if um, how much FDR was obviously aware of what Wallace was doing from FBI reports, and how much of a factor was that in his uh, decision not to carry Wallace forward as vice president? Um, FDR would have known very little from the um, um, FBI. Of course, um, Hoover had thrown out charges from time to time that wa um, Wallace was too close to the Soviets, but FDR didn't take that um, um, particularly seriously. However, the DNC leadership was absolutely united against Wallace going into um, 1944. Um, and they could see from Goze Roosevelt's gaunt, graying face that there was no way he was going to survive a fourth term. So whoever was vice president was going to become president. And they launched a full court press to convince him to take somebody else. Um, Truman was their preferred candidate along many dimensions, um, but they would have accepted um, uh, others. Um, Roosevelt, for example, was very fond of Jimmy Burns from South Carolina. Um, Wallace was neither his first nor second choice in 1940. He wanted Cordell Hall first, Jimmy Burns um, uh, second. He was happy, to, um, FDR was happy to run with um, Burns in 1944. Um, so, but the DNC leadership was uh, absolutely convinced that it, whoever it was, it couldn't be Henry Wallace. Um, FDR accepted um, this um, argument, but he was not able, as you, you know from the book, to look Wallace in the face and say, you're out. He had a really interesting uh, leadership style, FDR, of basically not making any decisions or right. uh, telling people any bad news. Yes. No, I'm, so I'm trying to FDR apply that here at the council. Actually endorsed, <laughs> FDR endorsed four separate people 
in four separate ways for vice president in 1944. And this produced complete chaos at the convention. At the convention. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, just the opening scene of the book is this chaotic moment of people rushing to the podium at the convention, including Claude Pepper, who I remember mm -hmm. as a senator. Pepper. Yep. In the, Red Pepper, as they call it. In the 70s, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, let me just, uh, uh, this gentleman on the, on the aisle. Look forward to reading the book. I have a question. My name is Albert Knapp. I'm a professor of medicine at NYU, Langone. My question is with regard to Henry Wallace, the geneticist. What was his opinion on Lysenko, Stalin's favorite geneticist? What's my opinion His opinion on, on Lysenko. What is Lysenko? He was oh, Stalin's, oh, what was his, Stalin's his views? corn geneticist. Ah, corn geneticist. I, 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 I don't know the answer to that, okay. that question. Really Gentleman right next to you. Here we go. Here. Hi, Philip Ellison. Uh, Mr. Steele, given that um, Harry Truman knew virtually nothing about uh, the Manhattan Project until he became president. Um, did, do you think that, that Wallace knew something about it through his intermediaries? And then would he have made a different decision about using the bomb in Japan and accepting the alternative of an invasion? So Wallace was um, part of um, Roosevelt's so-called top policy group um, uh, in 1941. Um, so these were, this were five individuals who really had primary um, um, advisory responsibilities with regard to what became the Manhattan Project. Um, and so Wallace was completely supportive of developing uh, atomic weapons. By 1942, the military had basically taken over the project, and Wallace is, for the most part, in the dark about it. Um, he himself, looking back on his career, likes to, to highlight um, um, uh, his, um, uh, his role, but it was really very minimal after 1942. However, it's important to note that Wallace never in any way expressed any reservations about developing the bomb or dropping the bomb. Um, and it's actually quite disturbing reading his diaries um, uh, in August of um, uh, 1945, when we, we dropped two bombs, there's almost nothing about it. Um, uh, he says almost nothing in cabinet about it. And when he's asked in his um, oral history in the uh, early 1950s what his views were, he said, nah, I can't really recall how I felt at the time which was really quite typical of, of Wallace. I explained early on in the book, I think if he were alive today, he would be diagnosed with Asperger's. Um, he really has great difficulty empathizing with um, um, human beings. So he's often presented um, by his um, um, uh, supporters as being a, a great pacifist. Um, he's not. Um, he was all in favor of killing as many Japanese and Germans as, as possible um, in the service of winning the war as early as possible and never expressed any reservations whatsoever about using the bomb. He gets um, uh, passionately interested in the um, issue of a, a atomic energy control um, once this becomes a, a live issue between Stalin yes, and the Truman uh, administration beginning in um, um, uh, late 1945. And then, as you know, he starts advocating for the Soviet um, position and starts attacking what he calls um, fascist elements in the US military and the State Department. Gentleman in the back. And my name is Dan Altman. Um, what you just said actually reminded me of um, one of the first times I was exposed to Henry Wallace, which was uh, this Netflix documentary from Oliver Stone, the, the Untold History of the United States. And I know, I know Oliver Stone has has you know his own complexities about his perspective, but in that documentary, uh, Henry Wallace is presented as as this great protagonist that could have taken. Um, the course of history in a different, more pacifist direction. And, and uh, I'm curious to hear maybe what you thought of, of that overall perspective. It, it seems like maybe based on what you just said, that's, that's kind of fantastical or, or fanciful. 
So I, um, I, I talk about Oliver Stone and his documentary in the first <laughs> chapter of my Do, do my you book. use air quotes? Or, uh, <laughs> if I could, could have illustrated my air quotes, uh, I would have. But he, he was definitely one of, the, one of the main reasons I wound up writing this book. Um, John Lewis Gaddis uh, at Yale, who was trying to persuade me that this was an important project, said you would not believe how influential Oliver Stone has been with his very intelligent, thoughtful undergraduate students who really believe that if Henry Wallace had kept his rightful place on the ticket in 1944 and hadn't been pushed off through bribes by this corrupt coterie of Catholic politicians at the Democratic Convention, there would have been no Cold War. Um, so this counterfactual question really animated me. Is, is it true that there would have been no Cold War? Um, my answer, as you know, is there would certainly have been a Cold War, or which would have been one that we would have basically um, fought at a great disadvantage. But there's one area in which I have strong agreement with Oliver Stone, and that is that individuals do matter. We are not just um, uh, impersonal um, uh, flotsam, you know, uh, floating on the, the forces of, of uh, history. Um, the um, convention in 44 could easily have gone the other way, and we would have had a very different president and a very, very different post-war history if Henry Wallace had been um, president. So in that regard, I thank all of us. Don't, you know? I would not have written this book if he had not made his document. <laughs> Let's uh, go to a, another online question, please. We'll take our next question from Jeffrey Laurenti. <clears throat> uh, ben, was the 1948 Wallace campaign argued by the candidate and by his campaign strictly in foreign policy terms? Uh, that is, was that the face he presented, which would fly in the face of usual American conventional political wisdom that American voters vote on domestic policy? had his issues on domestic policy, racial desegregation, right. and gender and racial equality and all that already been preempted by Truman? Um, did he ever connect with the unions and the other kind of democratic organizing base? And how, after Truman's unexpected election, did his views, if they changed at all, change in the years following? Well, Wallace gave himself enormous credit um, for having, um, or by his account, moved Truman to the left during the campaign. I talk about that in the book. There really isn't much evidence in that regard. Um, uh, Truman really repaired um, all the damage that had been done to his relations with the unions in 1946 when he, veto when he um, uh, vetoed Taft. Taft Hartley. Um, so that really undercut um, Wallace's efforts to connect with um, uh, unions uh, on the basis of domestic policy. But the unions at the time, in, in 1948, were staunchly anti-communist. Um, and so Wallace really um, alienated um, blue-collar workers around the country with his um, uh, pro Soviet position. Um, the most creditable <clears throat> aspect of Wallace's campaign in 48 was his uh, week-long tour of the South in August of 1948, where in town after town, um, he condemned um, racial segregation. And this took great courage at the time. He was being physically attacked with, with bats, with eggs. His car was being, being um, um, uh, beaten. He could easily have been killed over the course of that um, week in the South. And I give him enormous credit for his willingness to stand up like that at a time when it wasn't going to do him um, any electoral good whatsoever. Having said that, his um, actual explanation 
for um, uh, racial discrimination in the South were utterly insane. He claimed that um, white Southerners were, in fact, the, among the most progressive-minded people in the United States, and they were just being corrupted by venal northern corporations. And this really infuriated um, white supremacists in the South. <laughs> they thought, this man is patronizing us. Now, this is a time in American history when the phrase white supremacy was actually a badge of honor for many people. And they were furious that Wallace was saying, you know, these, these people, they're, they're just underfed. They were ruddy and out to beat him up. They didn't need any food whatsoever. They were absolutely furious. And so, you know, Wallace, on the one hand, had absolutely noble convictions. Uh, on the other hand, his understanding for the social dynamics in the country at the time were just off the wall. Footnote, please see prior council book of this month by Jacob Ware and Bruce Hoffman, God, Guns, and Sedition, <laughs> a history of right-wing extremism in the United States that talks about the rise of white supremacy uh, in the South uh, from the Reconstruction Reconstruction on. Uh, this gentleman here on the, uh, on the aisle and then back there on the second election. Adrian Karatnitsky with the Atlantic Council. So I want to go back to the, like, the Venona Papers, I don't know if you had a chance mm, sure. to think through the chronology of this, but by 43, signal intelligence has broken the Russian ciphers, and there's a lot of data coming, 43, 44. That isn't, apparently that isn't shared with the president, no. uh, and, and I know that it's not even shared with the president through like 1950. What Hoover happened? didn't know a lot of it. Yeah, sorry? Hoover himself didn't know a lot yeah, of it. Yeah, but, but who made that? Is it the army that made this decision? I mean, they were sitting on, were they analyzing this? Do you, do you? Yeah, what, what US you, military intelligence was very afraid um, that if they told the president, it would get out. Um, so they were, they were anxious to learn as much as they possibly could by continuing to decode these um, cables before they started um, uh, letting, letting others in the administration know that this, this information was, was there. So the president was really flying blind. Um, when Hoover made his allegations against Harry Dexter White, for example, he had no idea about the Venona um, uh, decrypts. Um, these decrypts actually continued on until, I believe, the early 1980s. Um, we didn't crack the, the um, first codes, I believe, until 1946 after the, uh, after the war. So this was very tightly held within the U.S. government. Uh, the gentleman there. Hi, uh, Thomas Gargiulo. So you mentioned Wallace as a man who changed his views significantly over time. And if you think about you know, politicians today, if they change their views, it can be seen as like a political ploy, right? Trying to win favor with the electorate right. or whatnot. But it also seems like everything you've said is, everything he's said has been pretty unpopular. So. Is everything he's doing, is anything he's doing like really a political move or was he just a man of conviction who just changed his views and was maybe volatile in his views or was anything political? There's, there's no doubt that um, he, he didn't have great political sense. But he, he definitely believed that the positions that he took at various points in time were in his political interest. So, for example, in 1948, he's trying desperately to distinguish himself um, uh, from um, Truman. And he's out to convince the country that there would be no Cold War except for Harry Truman. This is all the fault of um, uh, Harry Truman. So when Stalin initially vacillates on how to react to the Marshall Plan, Wallace does too. He does this sort of dance with Stalin from across the Atlantic. Which way will Stalin go? Once Stalin comes out and says, um, this is American imperialism, Wallace stands up and mimics it. Now, you could, you could say, well, was this politics or was this his conviction? For him, there was no distinction. Um, uh, he was, he was taking his orders essentially from Moscow, but because he believed 
that this would help him convince the American public that if he were elected president, there would be no Cold War. Of course, after um, uh, he gets crushed in the election, he gets barely 1% of the, the vote. In fact, 37% of his total vote came from New York City alone. Oh, really <laughs> remarkable, this city. Um, All from the Upper West Side, is that? <laughs> yeah. And the and, uh, uh, communist in the Bronx. Yes. Um, he, a after he, he loses, he f then tries to recreate himself as a mediator between um, the um, US administration and the Soviets. The Soviets don't take him seriously at this point, and Stalin issues orders, we're not dealing with this guy anymore. He sends back a cable saying, let Wallace screw around as he likes. Um, at that point, Wallace is deeply offended that these people have let him down. He personalizes everything. The American communists have let him down. The Soviets have let him down. And he's just looking for a pretext to cut links with these people. And he finds it in 1950 with the um, uh, North uh, Korean invasion of the South, suddenly he turns completely against the Soviet Union. He resigns um, his leadership of the Progressive um, Party. He says, actually presciently, presciently, he didn't have any of the um, documents that I have access to today, that the, um, uh, 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 the invasion was initiated by Stalin to get the United States and China into war with each other. This was absolutely true. So once he abandons what I call Jamesian belief in the book, he's a devotee of, of William James, who argued that it is sometimes rational to believe without any evidence. <laughs> um, once he abandons this, um, again, because he feels that he has been personally offended, he starts thinking quite rationally about the world and shows himself to be um, a very perspicacious observer of things going on in the world. For example, I, you know, he was a great gen uh, agricultural geneticist. He starts arguing that China is going soon enough to become the dominant force in the world, and he predicts their population today almost perfectly. Um, he's really a quite remarkably intelligent human being who um, just suffers from certain psychological baggage. <laughs> That's a great note to end on. Um, ben, thank you. It's a great read. Thank you for sharing with us. And for those, uh, for those in the room, there's a cocktail reception in the back. So I hope you'll join us for it. Thank you.